To get started on this project, you should have downloaded the Still Life Images folder, and inside of each folder, there's a photograph of three different pre-made compositions. You can pick and choose any one of these compositions that you want, but you're only required to do one of the photographs. With each of these photographs, there's also a texture reference picture, letting you know which kind of texture you need to be able to photograph or find online to apply to each of the different compositions. Now for mine, I was able to find a variety of different textures around my house and I use my simple cell phone to photograph each of their textures. So for instance, if I needed something that had a rust or even kind of a marbled type look, I found this old baking pan and I was able to photograph just it by itself. I was able to find a picture of linen or some sort of fabric material and also a picture of wood. Now, if you're not able to find these particular textures, you can find some of them online. Here's how. If you go to the internet search engine and do a search for whatever texture that you need. So let's say I'm looking for stone texture. You can go to images. And under the images, we want to make sure that we're getting a high resolution picture, but also a picture that's okay to use within our own compositions. So from here, especially if you're using Google Images, go to your tools and make sure the size of it is set to large and the usage rights is set to labeled for reuse. With this, this will give you a variety of different pictures that you can now use within your composition and freely make edits to. Now, as far as the texture goes, it doesn't have to 100% match exactly what's in your photograph. For instance, the picture that needed stone was this composition. So you can see the type of texture that I need needs to look similar to it, but it doesn't have to look exactly like this kind of picture. So if I was to go in and try to find something that's similar enough to it or close to that texture, I think this gets pretty close. Maybe it's a little too porous. Maybe something like this would be okay as well. Do make sure that when you download the image that you're getting the highest quality image available. Depending on the website that you go to, sometimes these are very easily done by simply clicking on the picture or sometimes it will require you to create an account and download it from there. Just make sure you're not wasting any money uh, in trying to get the images that you need. From here, I can drag this on, and now I can start to use this stone texture within my composition. I know this is a nice, high-quality image because when I open it up, it pretty much fills up my entire screen. I can also look at the file size of it and see that it's about a megabyte or larger. In general, if it's larger than that, then it should be good enough to use for your composition. Now that we've got all of the different textures and our still life picked out, let's go ahead and set this up to use as a reference photo. I'm gonna open up Photoshop. And let's go up to File, down to Open, and locate the still life reference images folder and the still life that you want to be able to work on. I'm gonna do this one for my demonstration. We'll say Open. As we've done with previous reference images, let's go up to view and show our rulers. So we'll turn that on and create a guideline of, or a grid of guidelines that we can use to help draw off our, um, our reference sketch. So we'll return to view, go down to new guide layout. Now the size of this document is eight by 10. So the number of rows and columns should be appropriate for this. Now, if you've chosen a document that's 10 inches wide and eight inches tall, it of course obviously should be eight by, or 10 by eight. So I'm gonna set my columns by eight, and my rows by 10. This will give us nice squared off images. Again, if you need to be able to customize the guidelines that you have, you can always go to Photoshop's preferences and then locate the guides, grids, and slices and then from here, you should be able to either change the, the, the color of the guides for your canvas and also the style of the guides that you're working from. And we'll say okay to that. 
I think the blue is okay for what I have, so I'm going to keep it like this. Now let's set up our actual document we'll create our painting in. Go up to File, Create a New Document. The size of this document, of course, needs to be measured in inches, and it needs to match the same proportions that you had for your original document. In my case, it was 8 inches wide and 10 inches tall. We're going to keep the resolution pretty high at 300 pixels per inch. Make sure you're working in RGB color mode. And for now, the background contents won't matter. So I'm just going to keep it at, uh, let's set it to be white. Later on, we're going to change this to our own uh, personal custom thing. We'll say create for this. And the first thing I want to do is to give my background not a solid tone, but an actual textured tone. So to do this, let's go up to File, down to Place, Embedded, and locate one of the textures that you photographed. Now, you are going to be required to find some sort of texture that can be used for your background. In my case, I wanted to use this sheet pan kind of texture as the background to be able to work on. So when I did this, I took a photograph of just the pan by itself. So this is what I'll place into my design. Then once it's in there, let's scale it up to make sure it fits just the solid texture and nothing else that I don't want as part of my design. Now from here, you can create any kind of edits that you want to do to this particular image. Let's say, for instance, I don't want it to be this warm kind of color. I actually want it to be more of a cooler type of design. So I'm going to go up to Image, down to Adjustments. And in this case, I'm going to change the hue and saturation of this image. From here, maybe I'll pull it into more of a cooler design. I'll choose Colorize to make it a little bit easier. Pull it into the blues. I'll also darken it up just slightly and bring down the saturation of it. This is what I want to be my main background for my image. Let's actually pull it a little bit closer to, there we go. With this done, now let's flatten our image to let this become our final background image. To flatten it, you can go up to the Layers drop-down menu, and at the very bottom, choose Flatten Image. Notice now that you've lost all of your layers and that single texture becomes your background layer that you can work on. Next, let's set this up and do a reference sketch that we can draw and paint from later on. To do that, let's go to our layers panel, create a new layer, and we'll call this my reference layer. And it's helpful for me to have a set of guidelines. So I'm gonna go up to view, down to new guide layout, and add an eight by 10 grid on top of this. Now I need to be able to see my still life beside the area that I'm working on. Another way that you can place your still life image exactly on the side is by clicking on the image tab at the top here, drag it off, and then carefully bring it over to the side so that you it uh, creates a little blue highlight. And when I let go, now my image is on this side as well. From here, I can click on the middle part, and drag it over so I can see both it and my working area and we'll scale this down so I can see both of these at the same time to be able to work on. We'll scale this one up give me as much room as possible. Do make sure your reference layer is selected whenever you do your reference drawing and for me I'm going to do my reference drawing using my pencil tool simply because it's easier Make sure your pencil tool has all the appropriate settings that you want to be able to work from. In my case, I'm just going to use a simple charcoal pencil to draw on for mine. And make sure you've got a color that shows up really well. Right now, I've got this really bright red. Let's make it a little bit larger. It's going to swap mine over to a white. I think that'll show up a little bit better for mine. Maybe I'll swap this over to black. There we go. As long as it's not a mid-tone, it should be able to show up well for my particular drawing. Now I can go through and use my reference guideline as a starting point to draw off each individual part and making sure to pay attention to some of the important details like highlights, shadows, 
and important edges of all of the different objects. Remember, the reference layer is supposed to be mostly a quick sketch. It's just to give you a good guideline to start off so that you can go back in later and add the tones, the values, and the colors for your final, uh, final composition and your final painting. All right, with my reference layer finished, let's go up to view. I'm gonna turn off my guides by showing or turning off the extras. And this should, again, give you a good reference, not only where the edges of each of your objects are, but I've also made some notations of where any dark or light spots may fall within each of the objects. Whoops, excuse me, within each of the objects. This will make it much easier to reference that whenever I have to paint in the tones for my final design. The next thing we need to do is to create an individual layer and base tone for each of the objects that are in your composition. To do this, take it one object at a time. So for instance, on mine, I'm gonna do the cup first. So I'll go to my layers panel. I'm gonna lock down my reference layer so I don't accidentally work on this, but every other layer needs to be below it. So I'll select my background, make a new layer, I'm going to call this my cup layer. The tool we can work in is going to be our basic brush tool. So select your brush. And the kind of brush that we can use for now just needs to be a simple, hard, round brush. Later on, we can go back in and start using some of our textured and blending brushes to add the details to it. But for now, we're just going to keep it a simple one to fill in solid areas. Now, as far as the tone or the color that you're working in, that's gonna depend on what the object is. But in general, you need to do whatever local color that you're painting. For instance, if I was doing the book, this way I could just paint it a solid mid-tone of red or solid mid-tone of blue for the ink. Since this chalice really isn't any one particular color, I'm just gonna do this kind of as a mid-tone of gray. Then later on, we're gonna go back in and add all the small highlights and shadows and all the details on top of this. For now, I'm just gonna focus on the solid tones to work in. So as far as a color goes, let's go for, eh, let's go for more of a mid-tone, that looks good. I'm even gonna warm it up just a bit. I think that'll look good for there. Do make sure to zoom in and pay close attention to doing a good job in filling in these tones and filling in any edges and details that you can have for your overall design. Now here's a little tip that I wanted to show you. Notice that I did the overall outline of this image and I didn't really do anything on the inside. Once you get the outline completely done, this is where you can go in with your paint bucket tool. And remember your paint bucket could be hiding underneath your gradient tool if you don't see it. With the paint bucket selected, make sure contiguous is turned on and all layers is unchecked. And if you've painted off an area that's completely enclosed, you can click on it once and it'll automatically fill in the entire thing. So that saves me a lot of time and headache without having to paint in all the small details. It doesn't work every time, but it works out pretty good for this particular instance. Another thing you may wanna do is to turn off your reference layer now, just to double check to see that everything does look really good. For instance, up here at the very top, I wanna to make sure this looks nice and rounded. So this is where I may use my elliptical marquee tool. With that selected, I can click and drag, and let's give myself a little bit better guideline for the top of my chalice. So I'm gonna make a oval selection. You can see now that top is going just outside the edge, all the way from edge to edge. Now when I use my brush tool, I can paint inside of it and I get a line that's nice and crisp and it stays 100% perfect. Like it was a good, uh, good curve from there. We'll deselect that. Also from here, I can look at the silhouette and I can see if there's any issues or problems. One thing when I do zoom in, let's zoom in a little bit more. When I use that fill bucket tool, sometimes it doesn't get the exact edge. You can see how there's like a little line of pixels right there that's happening. 
So to get rid of that, use your paint bucket one more time. And usually with after one more click, you can see how it'll automatically fill that in. That's just kind of a, it's not necessarily a bug. It's just not picking up on that good tolerance between the two different edges. What I meant to say was if you do see some part of your silhouette that you do need to correct, this is where you can go back in with your eraser tool. And with the eraser tool, I'm going to use again, another hard edge brush and clean up and repaint or redo any parts that I think could be done just a little bit better. All right. Now that we've got our reference image done for the cup, do the same process for each of the different parts of your entire composition, letting each thing have its own individual layer. So for instance, now if I wanted to do like the bottle or the little uh, ink bottle, I'm going to give it a new layer. I'll call it ink bottle. We'll say okay to that. I'm going to lock down my cup layer so I don't accidentally work on this one for here. That ink bottle is primarily blue, so the color that I'm going to work in is going to be just a really dark tone of blue. With this done, let me recap everything that I've done. Going back to my layers panel, notice that every single object or part of the object has its own individual solid tone and its own layer. So things like the book, the top of my book has one particular layer and the pages in the book have their own individual layer as well. The cup and the ink bottle, the pen, and even the reference layer obviously has its own individual part. The background, I did want to kind of pull in some of the texture that I have. So when I painted the background, or at least the new background that I'm working with, I tried to pick up on some of the tones, but in this case, I changed the blending mode to be overlays so that some of that background texture also shows up as well. Now, this depends on how you want to present your overall design. Later on, I may go back in and change this up. The final thing that you'll need to do is to go in and clean up any individual parts that need some uh, special touch up in detail. I'm going to turn off my reference layer. I saw one particular area. You can see where the cup and the bottle are touching. There was parts that just don't line up perfectly. So this is where I would go in. In this case, I'm going to go to my cup layer and unlock it, grab my brush tool, pick up that native color, and then I would go in and fix this one little part where they both touch in. The reason why you want to do this is because the next part that we're going to do, let's grab a dark edge brush, that for the next part we're going to be taking this and adding in all of the other details to it as well. 
So take some time, clean up, create each individual solid layer. And the next part is adding the textures, highlights, shadows, and other details.